Uh, I'm La El Hazan. I have been a member of the shul for almost 25 years. I can't believe it. That's kind of uh, amazing. I am fortunate to be married to uh, Giuliano Hazan, who is the son of the late great Marcello Hazan, who was a noted Italian cookbook author and food educator. Um, we, he followed in her footsteps and we do cooking classes in our home, uh, as well as we have week-long cooking courses in Italy. The villa behind me is uh, Palazzo della Torre. It's not a bad place to spend uh, a week. And uh, it's where we do our courses in Italy. My undergraduate degree is in Re Renaissance Reformation history because why not? That was an employable degree. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah. I uh, yeah. have always Script had a key. love of yeah. Italian and always continued to study um, because we go to Italy so frequently, at least twice a year for about six weeks. I've been able to continually visit and continue continually update uh, my interest. And so when Al uh, thought it might be appropriate I th uh, to do a lecture, I jumped at the chance and I thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share with you some of the great personal Italian Jewish personalities. This is an overview of Ita great Italian Jewish personalities um, because there are just too many to uh, fit into our short time periods, but I want to give you the flavor. Um, the reason I put the quote up there is um, to, there have been Jews in Italy for over 2000 years. And we think in the, we often thought in the 20th century about assimilation and how to, uh, con how to live in the greater community while still retaining our own self and our own um, identity. It is something that has been happening in Italy since there have been Jews in Italy. And so I will show you how some of the Jews figured it out or said enough is enough. With that, I will, uh, I want to introduce you to the first Jews whose names we know to step foot on the Italian peninsula. The likelihood is there were Jewish traders before, but their names have gone uh, to the beyond. Um, the first two were Jason Ben Eliazar and Eupolo I can't pronounce that, Eupolemus uh, Ben Yohanan. They were uh, from the Maccabees uh, as uh, they were sent by Judah Maccabees just after the rededication of the temple um, to help create an alliance. We know about them because they appeared before the Roman Senate and received uh, pledges of friendship. Since then, Jews have had a continuous presence in Italy. What we know um, about the early Jews in Italy, we mostly know from Philo. Ph uh, that is a supposedly a bust of Philo. And to the right, uh, or my right, um, the other picture is the Grand Forum, um, the Roman Forum in Rome as it stands today. Um, Philo himself uh, came from a no noble family. We know he actually visited the Second Temple in Jerusalem. He came to Rome as an embassy from the Alexandrian community, which was a part of the Roman Empire and where over a million Jews at the time lived. He wanted to secure the rights of the Jews uh, to Caligula, which if you know anything about Roman history, not the guy to get your rights from. Um, but he also was a great philosopher who tried to harmonize the Torah with the Hellenistic um, philosophy at the time. And he used a lot of allegory. Um, his works are preserved mostly because of, uh, he was contemporaneous, contemporaneous uh, with uh, the Christian Messiah and felt that, um, so his works were preserved in Christianity. So he has a push me pull ye in terms of Jewish history, but it's how we get some historical of what was happening at that time um, and an insight into uh, Jewish lives. The second person I need to introduce you to is the person we often call the Benedict Arnold of the Jewish history. It is, uh, 
Joseph ben Matthias or Titus Flavius Josephus. Josephus, the bust on the right, is supposed to be of him. These are his actual, uh, it's a translation of his actual works, but it is his work. And then uh, the picture is the um, Colosseum in Rome, which was built mostly by Jew Jewish slaves. Uh, Josephus started out as a general in the Jewish forces uh, against Rome in the Galilee. He surrendered in 67 to Vespasian, uh, Vespasian, uh, the Roman um, head at Yodafat, which is spelled meant many different ways. I chose that spelling, but I'm sure it's wrong. Um, there are many, many ways of spelling that. Ironically, he is the one who survived. His entire crew died. We're a little bit suspect about how. And he changed sides, becoming an advisor to Titus. What we like, what we use him for is because he wrote 21 volumes um, called The Antiquities of the Jews and recounted the Jewish wars. He was sent to negotiate with Nero as a young man. Um, he originally wrote his works in Aramaic, but then translated them to Greek. He's one of the first defeated generals to write of his own defeat and his own experiences. He blamed the Jewish wars on an unrepresentative and overzealous fanatics amongst both Jews as well as corrupt and incompetent Roman governors. Um, he moved to Italy, uh, where we know he was married at least four times. He, his versions are very difficult to read, but I highly recommend it if you are interested in this period uh, and to understand what was going on between Rome and um, the issue of Masada, he writes about. Um, again, he's considered the Benedict Arnold of the Jews because of the way he uh, portrays uh, the Jews. I show this picture of um, the Arch of Titus in Rome um, to again, talk about how we think of great, the, the push me, pull you of the Jewish experience. Titus in Jewish history is considered one of the worst of the Romans. He obviously hated Jews because he destroyed the second temple, as can be seen by this arch. The reality was a bit more complex. Titus, who was the son of Vespasian, defeated the Judean rebellion but his consort was, consort was Bernice. Bernice was the sister of Agrippa II who opposed the Jewish revolt and Bernice was Jewish. She, in her previous matter, marriage before she married uh, Titus had required the king of Pontus to convert to Judaism and be circumcised. Um, previous dynasty had faced Judaize, Judaizing tours and also after Titus, there were often Judaizing um, charges because uh, at that time there was a rise of interest in what religion did and how uh, religion uh, was perceived. Bernice, unfortunately, because of the politics was uh, forced into exile. Um, later emperors were, uh, accused of being Jewish when Christianity was at the as, uh, ascending. And uh, if they took the sides of the Jews, it ended up being bad for them. Finally, really with the fall of Rome, um, the, most of the synagogues in Rome were burned. What do we know of the life of the average Roman other than uh, from Titus's and uh, Philo's accounts? are mostly from the catacombs. And these are uh, three pictures of catacombs in Rome. There are six known. If you do have a chance to go to Italy, I highly recommend visiting. Two of them are open to the public. The epitaphs are very simple, um, but we will we get to know who people are. Uh, in the catacombs in Rome, there's only one mention of a woman. Uh, and that is Augustianus, who was the mother of the synagogue. And it's also the only title of for a woman in Rome. I'm sorry, it's the only woman who had a title in the catacombs, my error. 
Um, uh, she was probably what at that time is called an Arshon, which is a life officer. And we, many of the, uh, the inscriptions are life officer um, of whichever synagogue they happen to be uh, participating, um, they uh, were part of. But there are Jewish catacombs throughout Southern Italy and even <laughs> on the island of Sicily in Catania. And there are Jewish catacombs in Sardinia eight uh, catacombs, Not most of them are not open to the public. Talking about Southern Italy, um, ah, sorry. Um, Southern Italy at the, after the, during Roman times and then specifically after the fall of Rome was a thriving, very uh, busy community. Uh, and it was, known for great learning, uh, which uh, the quote so, says, out of Bari shall go forth the law. Um, there were the chief rabbi of Israel or Palestine at the time uh, was at, in the medieval time was from Bari. Um, also one of the uh, Spanish chief rabbis, uh, people, towns when they wanted a new chief rabbi, uh, would look to the uh, Tronto or Oria or Southern Italy because of the schools were considered so uh, fabulous. Uh, this was also a time when the Moors um, were attacking. So there were a, uh, there was a lot of movement of communities uh, because of instability. There are so many people I could talk to, talk about, but it's an area where it really hasn't been done justice in terms of uh, study, and there's so much more to learn. One of my favorite people is Shepatiah ben Amitai. He is a big biblical exegesist. He was a, a poet and a teacher, and he practiced Kabbalah uh, and truly believed in the power um, of magic, which was fairly common at the time. Um, he's also from some people call him the Harry Potter of uh, Judaism because uh, one time when the uh, uh, the Moors assessors attacked Oria, um, he was sent to negotiate. Negotiate. He traveled to Constantinople, Constantinople to plead for uh, the end to anti-Jewish decrees, uh, but he had been told that the princess was held by the power of the demon he was able to deliver her from the demon and in fact put the demon in a lead jar that he carried back from her the, uh, uh, out of pleasure, um, the, uh, the Basil the first said uh, that they wouldn't be, uh, there wouldn't be problems with, for the Jewish communities. Um, however, <clears throat> and there are multiple, multiple stories uh, regarding um, him doing various demon uh, exorcisms. However, he is also known for his poetry and even to this day in the Ashkenazi liturgy, um, he, one of his poems is included in the traditional Mila service. So Southern Italy is in flames and we're getting into what many people would call medieval times or the dark, uh, pre-medieval, the dark ages when what happened and where were the Jews? Um, not much is his, known about this. We've got the fall of Rome and everybody's fighting each other. In fact, what we know as Roman Italy is truly breaking up. We have Byzantium um, owning big parts of Italy, and then you've got the Moors in the southern part of Italy, and really things are starting to break up and will be reformed as the city-states of Italy. Um, amongst this, uh, people don't travel because it's incredibly dangerous, and you've got the Huns and um, a, a lot of wars going on, but you have a group called the Radhanites. And these are traders who we now think are really Jewish traders. And what they used were a system of staying with their co-religionists in various communities. And that's how they were able to travel safely because uh, as a Jew, you have to take in a Jew. Um, so they 
the most famous of these traders is Benjamin of Tudela or Tudela. Uh, he traveled in 1159 and really took a full 10 years or more um, through to, uh, to cross from Spain. And there is now a town in his name in Spain and he went through Persia. So you thought Marco Polo was the first? No. Um, it was a Yid. And uh, he visited communities throughout Italy and kept a diary called the Book of Travel. That diary told how many Jews were in a, a community. And it's how we get the sense of who lived where and the movement of communities because he traveled so long there was movement. As time deteriorated and the countries uh, deteriorated, um, the persecution of the Jews grew uh, more severe. And at some point, the Jews were not allowed to own land, although in Southern Italy, prior to uh, this period, they had been, and in fact, were very successful farmers and uh, grape growers had uh, lots of things, um, different professions. Um, but the, this was a time of constriction and uh, people who, uh, for the Jewish, an exclusion for the Jewish people. So the Jews had to look for opportunities. Um, one of the things that became um, an important opportunity was money lending because of uh, Judas and uh, the 30 pieces of silver, it was considered uh, not a good thing for uh, Christians to do it, but Jews could. Um, also, Jews went into professions that needed uh, literacy, such as becoming a uh, a um, physician. On the other spectrum, they also became much poorer and ended up having to become the uh, secondhand clothes dealer, the Stratzita Kata, uh, especially in Rome. Um, as Italy devolved into its city-states, different city-states would invite Jews in because they needed that professional knowledge. So Jews would go there, and when they got kicked out there, somebody else would, another uh, community would uh, um, invite them in. Um, for me, one of the most interesting things uh, of this period is the um, the Bianco, I'm sorry, the Banco Rosso, which is the picture on the top left. That's a picture of the bank that still stands in Venice, Italy. Um, there was a statement saying Andare in Rosso, meaning I go to the Red Bank. There were four banks, Jewish banks in Venice that were allowed. One was green, one, um, but one of the more famous ones that does still stand is the red one. But Andare in Rosso, I go into the red has is still today so when you go into the red you're defaulting so but it's from that time period and from that bank these are the things i really think are fabulous um i do have to talk about shylock no he really didn't exist we all know he didn't exist but he um he may have been based on a jewish Jewish money lender, possibly Rodrigo Lopez, but we're certain that Shakespeare, first of all, there were no Jews in England at the time. They'd been kicked out 300 years older, 300 years ago, and um, it, and uh, that he would not have known anybody. Uh, interesting enough is Shylock's getting um, some reconstruction these days um, and uh, is being played to a more sympathetic light. Not all Jews felt that their felt, many Jews felt their lives constrained by staying Jewish. It was very hard to stay Jewish, especially as the city state started to grow in power. Uh, Jews lost, uh, became more persecuted, and life was uh, very difficult. Um, one of the families that did uh, become Christian was the Scrogeni family. And I put this up because this is one of the most exquisite art pieces of the um, late medieval early um, time. This is a Giotto fresco, it's in Padova. I hope uh, 
if you haven't been, you have a chance to go. Scrovigny was a banker. His father, Rinaldo, was given a place in Dante's Inferno. Um, and it was believed that he was trying to clean the family name by giving, creating great public art. Um, he is the donor and he's kneeling. You can see his hand um, reaching for the gift of the church. Uh, Giotto spent a day on the hand. And you can see if you look near the hand, it's discolored. That's because so much time and effort, the fresco dried and had to be redone where he was uh, uh, painting. There are many other great arts uh, given by Jews. Whoops. Um, and one is from another moneylender. This is the Norsa family in Mantua. Um, This was less intended. They stayed Jewish. Uh, the Norsa family had uh, grown wealthy and he was finally, he was given permission to buy a house. The house had a painting of the Virgin and Child on it. He had a glacial ecclesiastical permission to wipe the surface clean and he put the sundial on it. Everything was fine until there was a, what we would call a pogrom and a new papal bull against the Jews. And so two years later, a mob started to uh, really surround his house. And the Duke Francesco Gonzaga said he would be pardoned if he uh, would uh, change the picture um, and put the old picture back. Um, the mob was not accepting of that and burned the house to the ground. So the Duke had to figure out how was he going to control his people um, and he would of course, and become the victor. So he told the people that he would pardon a Jew if the Jew would construct a chapel on the site and commission a painting. Um, the belief is that the Madonna della Victoria, um, which uh, is from Mantegna, uh, and it's the picture on your left, was the picture commissioned. The bottom uh, person praying to uh, the Madonna is uh, Duke Francesco. Uh, that painting was not put in the chapel. Um, that painting ended up in Gonzaga's house, and another painting had to what, replace it. It's also a virgin of chapel, uh, a virgin uh, painting, but at the bottom of it, it shows that the virgin is on top of the Jew. And that is your picture to the right. It's believed the man in the red hat is Daniel Norsa. You can see that he's wearing a uh, circle, um, which is the badge of being Jewish. Uh, Mantova was taken over many different times. Uh, a little man with a stomachache, otherwise known as uh, um, Napoleon, liberated, shall we say, the painting and that now, the painting from Montaigne on your left now is in the Louvre. Um, seems like a fitting place. Another job that uh, Jews were able to do were becoming were goldsmiths, and many great Italian um, families will have become goldsmiths. Um, one of the most famous is Salomon da Sasso, known as Ercole di Fedeli. Uh, many of his works can be found in the Met, um, as well as elsewhere in Europe. The mo most famous of his pieces is the uh, piece on your right, which the two is called the Queen of Swords, and he made it for Cesare Borgia. Um, Ercole di Fedeli had, came from Ferrara from a goldsmithing family, he had to uh, convert. Um, it, he converted under mysterious circumstances. Uh, the belief was he was told that he was going to be outed as a homosexual, which uh, carried the pain of death unless he converted to uh, Christianity. Um, the piece to your right held a megilla, and that was from Venice, which had some of the most notable jewelers at the time. That's Abraham Mo um, ben Moses uh, I spoke about the Medici. For those of you, I see many of your names that you were at my first one, so I just want to touch that Cosimo de Medici felt that the uh, Jews would help as he started uh, gaining more and more power, and he created um, Pisa and Livorno as free states for the Jews. Um, and so the Jews, m many Jews moved to Tuscany. 
Uh, one of the first to settle in uh, Tuscany is why? Ah! I love being so. You can tell I'm technically literate. Um, Yahil of Pisa. He was a philanthropist and a scholar and a great banker. He was one of. Um, he was on intimate terms with um, Isaac Abravnel. For those of you who remember the uh, Ferdinand and Isabella Inquisition incident. And he received King Alfonso's ambassadors to the Pope in his own home, which must have been magnificent, but we don't have any, uh, or at least I haven't found any uh, anything about his real home. He may have, it sounds like his home was open to many scholars and he did a lot of protection uh, as well as redeeming of captives. He's one of the people he protected was uh, Johanan Alemano, who was an early teacher of Pico de Marandola and uh, was also a uh, noted scholar. At the, the picture on your left is the shul in uh, Pisa as it looks today, and the bottom left is the cemetery of Pisa. The bottom picture is of a Jewish woman in Milan. It's a little later than her, uh, than the picture, but it, I just put it in because at the end of his life, um, apparently, uh, Daniel was uh, very uh, depressed and dis uh, like uh, unhappy because one of his uh, daughters uh, be left for apostasy. She married a Christian and became Christian. One of the great women, uh, Jewish women of uh, the Renaissance period was Donna Ben Benvenida. Um, Abravanel. Abra she was, her uncle was Isaac Abravanel. Uh, and she married her first cousin, Samuel Abravanel, who, uh, who was also, her, his uncle was also uh, Isaac Abravanel. The family came to Naples in 1492 and became leaders of the Jewish community. They're of Sephardic origin. Um, and marrying your first cousin was very uh, common during that time period. It helped keep the family wealth all in the family, uh, which was a very important thing to do. She, because of her influence, although Charles V of Spain ruled Naples, they deferred exiling the Jews uh, because of her influence. She was supposedly incredibly pious. She fasted every day, which I think means that she only ate at, uh, after dark. Um, she, we know she redeemed at least 1,000 ransoming of the captive. Um, she also had a large following in her, and a large, um, she was known for her literacy and, and tutored a lot of uh, important women, uh, specifically Eleanor de Toledo, who was the daughter of the viceroy of uh, the Spanish rulers, but who became um, Cosmo de Medici's wife. And so uh, that helped with the family um, and where they were moving to. Unfortunately, even her works couldn't um, keep the Jews out of uh, getting from getting, getting kicked out of uh, Naples and the family moved to Ferrara. There Samuel died, but he died giving her, making her the heir to the will, which was something that wasn't done, uh, especially in Jewish tradition at that time. Uh, lots of political family politics. Uh, it ended up going to rabbis both in Turkey and Italy, and she defended herself saying that he, his will was notarized by Christian notaries. And therefore, it was binding because the law of the land is binding on Jews. Um, she was very clever, and her wealth grew. She finally received um, permission to own five banking establishments in uh, Tuscany. One of the great, we're moving a little up in time period, um, one of the great um, golems and great thinkers of uh, Venice is Leon Modena or Yehuda Arya Nimodena. Uh, he was a scholar who par excellence. 
he became the chief Hebrew translator for the government in Venice. And he wrote responsa on everything from playing tennis, traveling on the, by boat on the Sabbath, going bareheaded. Um, unfortunately, although he was brilliant, he was not fabulous in his private life for shepherding his uh, own funds. He had a very bad gambling habit and would often uh, get in fights with his second wife um, because he couldn't he kept on losing basically everything they had. This was uh, used against him when he wrote responses that people didn't like. So there was a lot of course um, uh, politics. He was offered the chair of Oriental Studies at the Sorbonne, but he would have had to convert, so he had to decline it. Um, he, many writings, but probably the most important was the Yiriti Hibreki. Uh, which is the first Jewish text addressed to non-Jews since Philo had written. Um, his writings were re-found in the 19th century, and he's considered uh, the precursor to the reform movement now. Um, the picture is the Italian synagogue in Venice, which is where he uh, sang his cantor for 40 years. He had many, many students. Um, but he also liked uh, to sing and he was known to participate in get dancing. So this is a gentleman who lived in the ghetto, but also moved outside of the ghetto. Dancing, we don't think of Jews and dancing very, uh, as going as sinner, uh, together often. However, one of the great Renaissance dancers was Guillermo Ibreo de Pasara, which means William, they call him William the Jew. Um, his writings on dance are still followed today. He did have to, um, he, he also was pressured and finally converted, um, but he taught all of the, um, the court dances and he, uh, especially to the Sforza family in Milan uh, and wrote a lot in uh, Ferrara. Two other, well, another um, of the great thinkers and great, ah, sorry, family dialogues um, are the Del Medi Medigio. Um, I put this picture up. If you look at the top, this is a uh, Medici picture, and it's believed that Elijah del Medigio is uh, the blue, uh, is, is in this picture. He's the uh, guy in blue. You can see the uh, closer up on the right. Uh, he's underneath the uh, horses prancing um, in the top picture. This is a picture uh, in the Medici chapel and is very visible today. He chaired the, um, he had the chair of philosophy in Padova. So although Jewish, he was still able to um, write and his works were still very important uh, for not only Jewish students. In fact, he taught Pico della Mirandola as well as uh, the man who became the Cardinal of San Marco. He was very against Kabbalah and argued against it and argued that it wasn't anything old at all. Um, he's no, known for writing the Sefer, but not Hadat. His grandson, Joseph Solomon del Medigio, decided his grandfather was completely wrong and May and was very pro Kabbalah. However, he was known as a naturalist. He was a friend of Galileo and in fact was known as rabbi, as Galileo's rabbi. He lived in Padova and he wrote Elim, but he believed that he wanted Jews to reclaim their prominence in the greater world, especially through natural sciences. The other great Jewish uh, woman, she was an Italian, but she spent so much time, I figured we needed to uh, have her part of us, uh, was Donna Grazi Mendez Nazi. She was born in Portugal. Oh, I'm really bad at that, I apologize. 
Uh, she was born in Portugal uh, and married uh, to a trader. When he died, she became the uh, person overseeing the fortune. Um, they, the family moved to Antwerp. Uh, there were some altercations with the police, shall we say, and she then moved to Venice. All the time, she's amassing more with trade, mostly in pepper. Um, she also had to deal with her sister. Um, so there's some, some fun family feuding, if you ever read the book. Um, and she left, at, until she left Venice, she was a crypto Jew. She was not out as a Jew. When she moved to Ferrara, she came out as a Jew and lived the rest of her life as a Jew. We have a lot of the Jews moving from Spain who are crypto Jews. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure in the community. Do you accept them as Jews? How should they be Jews? Do they want to continue being Jews? And what if they have a Jewish name, but they're no longer Jews? Um, so there's a lot of push me pull ye, especially amongst families themselves. She done not, uh, Grazia moved, um, supported literacy, which I'm not because I can't spell it, uh, and printing. Um, the 1553 Ferrara Bible is dedicated to her. When she moved, she finally decided to move to Constantinople because of um, pressure as well as that was her main seat of uh, trade. And there she assumed a leadership role in the Sephardi world. One of the big things she did was organize a boycott of Ancona in 1556. Uh, Ancona uh, was a papal state and uh, had executed 25 Jews because of the libel of Trent, uh, Simon of Trent, if you recall your history. Her, her boycott was very rare. It was the first one that we know of. Um, and she organized no Jewish uh, it was the first form of, at that time, of Jewish resistance. However, it didn't get a huge amount of support because the Ancona Jews themselves felt that uh, if there was a boycott, they would lose their livelihood. She really wanted Jews to become self-sufficient, and she had this belief of creating a Jewish uh, settlement in Tiberias, and that is what the stamp to the right uh, shows the stamp, uh, that was to have occurred. Another great artist, um, we're moving up a little bit, a hundred years, um, but if you go to Jewish museums, often you'll hear his work, is Solomon Rossi from Mantua. Um, I was going to play, but I realized I'm going to be over time if I do too much, so I'm going to be skipping, trying to go a little faster. Um, he published 150 secular works, but he is really the transition from Renaissance to Baroque music. And uh, his, unfortunately, he died during an Austrian attack in Mantova, but he was a court violinist and his work is still uh, used and not just by Jews, but um, throughout the world today. If those of you who can take a screenshot, um, please feel free to, and uh, you can listen to some of his glorious music. Um, Sarah Copia is a Jewish poetess who lived in Venice. I just put a little bit, a stanza of her poetry. Um, she's mostly known for her manifesto, which was uh, her explanation of uh, why she believed what she did. Again, she was Jewish, a proud Jew living in the ghetto. She ran salons, which were attended both by uh, erudite Jews and Christians, um, and all were able to, uh, felt uh, they gained knowledge um, from her. Jewish Jews have always been known as the people of the book, and Italy was. Uh, for at least 300 years, the main area for the printing of Jewish books. One of the first was the Sonsino family of the Sonsino Bible thing. They uh, moved to Italy in the 14th century. In fact, the belief is they helped finance the Gutenberg Press. 
Um, however, Jewish books were not allowed to be printed. Um, they brought what they learned from Gutenberg to, they migrated to um, uh, Piedmont, what we know as Piedmont now. Um, they weren't the earliest, but they perfected the type. And uh, the current family, the current Sonsino Press is an homage to them. It is not a family um, uh, press. Unfortunately, much of their work, the original family's work, was destroyed by the Nazis. I also put on the right, uh, that's a Sapotina Foa, um, which was also a great printing family. And that's known as a colon, which is the printer's mark. And you can see it's a palm tree with a, uh, um, a Mogan David in it. Uh, in the 16th, well, uh, the 16th century, Venice with its ghetto faced a real problem. Solomon ben Nathan Ashkenazi, or Solomon de Udine. Udine is now part of Italy. At that time, it was sort of Italian, mostly German, uh, when he was born. He studied medicine at the University of Padova and became the chief physician to uh, the King of Poland. The Poland was subservient to the Ottoman Empire, so Solomon ended up moving to Istanbul. A court physician has close ties because they get to see the viziers and their rulers very frequently. He did, and he was the guy chosen to be the ambassador to Venice. At that time, Jews were stuck in a ghetto and had a horrible existence and were not part of the courtly life. Uh, however, they made an exception from him and he worked hard to have uh, the Jews readmitted because the Jews were getting kicked out of Venice uh, at that time. And so uh, he truly worked for his country, um, country people. I ha I'm moving quickly. Um, Napoleon was not a Jew, but he was very well uh, respected by the Jews of Italy who called him Helicto, the good part from Bonaparte. And um, he, he took down the gates of, uh, of the ghettos and allowed the Jews to start participating in Italian culture. In fact, in all shuls, they put a special prayer of gratitude in his honor. Um, after, unfortunately, after his defeat, there were again more restrictive measures, but the gates of the ghettos never went back up. Unfor um, Jews were trying to become part of society and often felt they were a part of society and then something awful would happen which is the story of the kidnapping of Edgardo Montara. Um, this is in 1858, what people thought was a civilized time period. When uh, Edgardo was two, his parents were out and he had been left in the care of a non-Jewish servant. He became very ill and they, she thought he was going to die. So she took him to the priest to, um, to get uh, the last, uh, whatever they do, I, I forgot the word. In any case, uh, he, he grew up to six and she realized on talking to the grocer that kids who had been um, sent to the priest needed to be raised as Christians. She took uh, the grocer, not her because she was fairly uneducated uh, and really did love the family. Uh, called it into the priest. Bologna at that time was under papal rule. The, um, the priest came and took the six-year-old away from the family. The picture is, of course, the mother fainting and the, the father um, trying to reach his son. The family was able to see him while he was in Bologna. Um, again, three, well, the father was, the mother wasn't. Um, but then the uh, child was whisked away uh, to uh, live under papal authority, uh, and he eventually became a priest. He, this was international outcry, uh, like the Dreyfus Affair, but uh, the Catholic Church wouldn't do anything about it, and he uh, finally was 
Um, he became a priest. The father died. The mother reconciled to him, but he never uh, he never was able to. Uh, he did not re convert back or go back to the family. I'm going to quickly go uh, to unification, what Italians called the Risorgimento. Italian Jews were very participatory and served in many um, active uh, roles in the wars. Also, Italians wanted to become part of Italian, um, sorry, Jews wanted to become part of the Italian culture and created their own coats of arms. All of these are Jewish coats of arms, mostly mostly starting in the 19th century. Jews were not only scholars, they were also artists. Um, one of the most famous is, of course, Amedo Clementi Montagliano, who's on the stamp. But you have uh, the Macaloni group during the Risorgimento and going up to the early 20th century. Unfortunately, there were many Jewish artists who uh, ended up in the camps. Uh, the, Picture on the right is from Aldo Carpi. He was he went to Mauthausen. He actually survived, and he uh, was um, his artwork. He died in 1970, but he did a lot of artwork in the camps. Uh, Jewish architects mostly had to con convert to Christianity. One of my uh, favorite stories, though, is of Nicola Matas. Many of you who've been to Flores may recognize. Uh, the uh, Church of Santa Croce, Michelangelo, Galileo Galilei uh, are all built, um, built, buried there. Ironically, uh, when they, he built the facade uh, in the uh, 19th century, when they hired him, they didn't ask if he was Jewish and he did take Saturdays off. Um, they didn't notice the big Mogan David in the top of the church. And, but when he died, it caused consternation because he wanted to be buried in his church. Um, so this is where the story divides. Some say that he wanted to be buried by his facade and that's why he's buried at the door, um, almost in the church, but not quite. Others say he was buried that way because he was Jewish and not Christian. There are many Jewish politicians of Italy uh, some of the most famous were, of course, the Prime Minister Luigi Lozzati in 1919. Uh, that's the picture of him. Um, he was the founder of the credit union. He was an economist. Uh, Ernesto Nathan was the mayor of Rome in 1907 to 1913. We unfortunately have to give him credit for uh, the monument that I have the picture of. Uh, it's the monument to Vittorio, but... Uh, uh, in Rome, you call it the typewriter monument because it looks like a typewriter. It's also a place where there's always traffic. Um, the smiling gentleman is Nicola Zingaretti. He's currently the president of the uh, Democratic Socialist Movement, as well as of Lazio. He's likely to become the next prime minister, so look out for him. I can't continue without talking about uh, the Shoah, but I'm, it's, of course, a uh, course on itself. There are issues with Italy and the fascist state um, because until 38, there weren't the racial laws. So many, especially the richer, higher up Jews really thought there wasn't going to be a problem. Um, so there was again, a push me, pull, pull me. Um, I talk about syndrome K, which is a, uh, how uh, some, the doctors, Adranio Ossini, uh, save Jews in Rome by admitting them with this deadly non-real disease, um, but uh, the Nazis didn't realize it. And those are Jewish partisans, the pictures of a Jewish partisan unit, um, the Jewish Brigade actually, uh, in Turin. And the picture above is after liberation, uh, there was a camp for before they went to uh, Israel, but in Southern Italy. I have to talk about Margarita Sarfati. She's not my favorite person. She was born wealthy into a family of uh, very wealthy uh, Jews who actually started the Biennale in Venice. Um, but she's mostly known because she was Miss Mussolini's uh, mistress until 1938. Uh, she, and she helped influence his policies. 
because of the pressure, she became Catholic, but not really. And so she left during the war, realizing the writing was on the wall. Um, she did return to Italy and became influential in Italian art. Her picture is immortalized as the two women. Uh, she's one of the two women uh, on the bottom picture. Uh, you can see the man uh, kissing somebody's hand. She's one of the women looking on. Um, that is at the Grand Hotel Palace if you go, when you go to Rome. There's a lot of refinding of Jewish history. Um, the National Museum of Italian Judaism and Shoah is a new museum. It's near Ferrara. I highly recommend going to see it. There are so many Jewish writers, I can't even talk about them. Um, but Roberto Savagno, uh, who's the brother, if you like uh, um, Detective Montebaldo, it's on TV right now. He's uh, kind of the uh, Colombo of Sicily, really fun. Um, but his brother, Roberto did an expose on the crime families of Sicily and he now lives under protection. But all of these names, uh, are mo most of them are known to Americans, but uh, extraordinary writers who have contributed not only to Jew Jewish uh, uh, history, but uh, to understanding um, Italian history. I have to tell you about one of my favorite people. Uh, her name is Rita Levi Montalcini. She won the Nobel Prize in, uh, for medicine in 1986 because of her isolating the NGF. She hid during the Shoah and became a senator of life. And she was very verbose even in her latter years. Uh, at 94, she got into an altercation where one of the senators who call, called the 94 year old uh, a whore and she just gave it back to him quite well. Um, but I love her quote that at 100, I have a mind that is superior thanks to experience than when I was 20. So I thank you for letting me go on um, a, probably a little too long, but I want to take some questions if we, uh, we have the time. I don't see anything in the chat, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if you want to unmute yourself. Uh, uh, so um... Yeah, I, it's Joel. I do have a question. Uh, a slide went by pretty quickly. It said France invaded Italy and the Jews were expelled. Sort of. What does sort of mean? Uh, it depended if where I'm trying to find my slide. It was way back in the program. I'm sorry. I went That's too fast. Right. I, you have to, I, I have so much material and I'm trying to cut, trying to cut. Um, it depends where they were and the time period. Um, and who they paid off. Oh, um, in, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I'd have to go back and find okay. the slide. It's all right. When I find it, I'll tell you. Uh, yes, Jay? Uh, you're when, on we were, when we were in Venice, we went to a mask maker and he made a mask. Uh, he called it the Jew's mask or the doctor's mask. And that yes. was used, uh, during the Carnival, but it was also used in the Middle Ages for doctors who would stuff cotton in the mask so that they wouldn't catch. And it was, it's very well known. We have it hanging in our house. Terrific, it's the plague mask and it's uh, a very famous shape. Um, and the, the, the masks are stunning. Any other questions I can answer? If you're interested, I do have resources I'm happy to share. I'm putting my info in the chat um, because I made that slide go too fast. Um, I'm happy to tell you or help you uh, um, in your travels in Italy or elsewhere. I am a travel advisor, shameless plug, but I uh, would also, there are some wonderful off the beaten path Jewish destinations in Italy um, that are gorgeous to see. And it's not just all cemeteries and shuls, um, which are also interesting, but I uh, want to make sure that you can get your fullest experience. Anything else I can do or, uh, yes, Esther? I think after the war, I know after the war, uh, a lot of uh, Jews ended up in Bari and the people in Bari did uh, help them. And uh, then they left from Bari to Israel. 
Uh, yes, that was one of the deportation camps. They call them the deportation camps in translation. Yes. Okay, Israel to help them uh, get uh, settled and uh, leave Bari. But while they were in Bari, they supposedly were treated well. I yes. read that that picture is actually from the camp in Bari. Oh, the the picture that I had. Yes, Paula. Yes, just um, after the war, there were a lot of Jews from I from Egypt who became Italian citizens because they said that their ancestors had come from a place that had been so bombarded that there was no, no more any documentation of whether that was true or not. And they jumped on it. And I don't remember the name of the place in Italy, but it's where it was well known that uh, Egyptian Jews were able to become Italian citizens. I will have to look into that. I'm not familiar. Yeah. It's where there were a number I, I met. I know a few. I'll ask my father-in-law. My, my father-in-law's family left in 39, a little bit late. Um, unfortunately, not all of them did. Um, one of the, we've just discovered um, a trove of documents um, from uh, one of the family members who actually had uh, a, uh, a villa, uh, a summer home, on uh, the Adriatic coast that was right next to uh, Mussolini's house. And they had to leave and unfortunately didn't survive. Um, but uh, especially the wealthier Jews for the Shoah, it, it was hard to real believe that anything was going to happen. Um, so especially, this family lived next to Mussolini. He had kissed the wife's hand. Why would, how would anything happen to them? Any other questions I can answer? This is an area that hasn't been studied enough. Uh, you know there are many, many stories waiting to be told and that uh, hopefully in the future uh, there will be. Uh, there seem to be more interest. Uh, they haven't ever done a story, a uh, exhibition of Jewish Italian artists. Uh, in any museum yet. There are, it's a wonderfully ripe um, thing to study. So tell your children and grandchildren, this is a great field. We need more study. Uh, yes, Esther. The star in the church of Santa Croce, was that meant to be a, a Magain David star? Well, Nicola Matas, uh, who is the architect, um, we believe was Jewish. It's not in any literature that he was Jewish, but he didn't work on Shabbos. And uh, so, yes, it, it, he comes from a Jewish, it's a Jewish name, last name. Okay. Well, I thank you so much. And um, I appreciate the person who asked me, am I considering a book on Italian Jews? Maybe someday if I can figure it out and condense it, but thank you. That would be a lot of fun.